It reminds me of a, a church I read that they had a rather large lady who was a soloist, and she came up and sang uh, a special, I'll Fly Away. And then right after that, the choir sang, It Took a Miracle. That was horrible, wasn't it? I don't think that was politically correct. I didn't say anybody in particular. It's just fictitious. So, all right, I'm sorry. Second Kings chapter 22. Second Kings chapter 22. I'm glad you guys are patient with a fallible pastor. All right. The title of my sermon tonight is Faded Jeans. Faded Jeans. G E N E S. Second Kings twenty two two, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the way of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Tonight we're going to find out to whom that verse is referring and learn some things about how to maybe, uh, if we have faded genes, G-E-N-E-S, how we can move forward with confidence and for God's glory. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we pray that you will bless the reading of it. And that you will guide us in all truth in this time we have together. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. You know, many times we find ourselves <clears throat> in situations that are less than ideal. Um, maybe it was a job. We thought it was a dream job. We got in it and it's difficult. It's just a challenge can become unbearable. Um, even our greatest hopes and dreams sometimes don't work out. Um, Maybe uh, as a little girl, you thought about, you know, having a house with a white picket fence and perfect family, perfect children, all these things. And then people get in situations and they find their family experience is more like the title of the book that Barbara Johnson wrote called, uh, Mom, Give Me a Hammer, There's a Fly on Dad's Head. <laughs> I always loved that title. As in our text this evening, our lives often move in the same direction of the examples that are put in front of us. And I think tonight, not only is this an opportunity for us to reflect on maybe some positive examples that we've had in our lives that have produced a lot of who we are along with the Lord guiding us, but it's also a reminder to us of the responsibility that we have in leaving a heritage. Mike Cicado tells about a man named Stephan who had inherited his family's 400-year-old German forest, passed down from generation to generation to generation, all the way down to him. The trees that he harvested were planted 180 years ago. And the trees that he plants won't be ready to be harvested until his great-grandchildren are of age. He's part of a chain of generations that have to make a choice. The choice is, will they pillage or will they plant? Will they rape the land and get rich or will they invest and take care of the land and harvest only what is theirs and leave an investment for future generations? Stephan harvests seeds sown by men he never knew. And he sows seeds to be harvested by descendants that he will never meet. Dependent upon the past, responsible for the future, he's part of a chain. You know, we're a lot like Stephan in that regard. In that we are children of the past, we're parents of the future. Uh, we're born into a forest uh, that was seeded by people that uh, some we don't know we've never met before I look forward to heaven for that very reason to be able to meet some of the people that influenced my life in ways that I don't even know right now 
but I'll learn in heaven. I think that's going to be one of the sweet, sweet parts, along with so many things about heaven. It's just the people we're going to meet and the things we'll discover. The Bible says we see now through a glass dimly, but then face to face. So with that, how, how is your family forest doing? That's a good question. Are there rooted trees that are, that are rooted deep in spiritual conviction because of where you have grown up? Is there row after row of rich truth and heritage, biblical heritage? Do you stand in your forest, your family forest, with pride, with, with excitement about what's happened? You know, maybe this evening, uh, it's not like that. As you look at your past, as you look at those who've influenced you, it's not that great of a uh, of, a, of a heritage that you have. Maybe your parents didn't take you to church. Maybe um, it wasn't like that for you. Maybe uh, the harvest was taken by those people, but they never sowed really into your life. And sometimes it's easy for us to feel cheated in those situations. And maybe the question this evening should be, and because I'm always about you know, we can debate what has happened in the past, but really when it comes down to us as believers, really it comes down to what are we going to do from here forward? What responsibilities are we going to take? Are, and I guess the question is, are you willing to take the responsibility? Am I willing to take the responsibility with the days that I have left on this earth to be a positive impact to those who are around me? Well, our text introduces us to someone with whom we can relate and I believe someone that we can emulate when we consider here accepting our responsibility with our heritage he must have had the same frustrations that so many people that are born into bad heritages have I want you to listen to the heritage that this guy was born into his grandfather was a murderer and a mystic who sacrificed his own children in ritual abuse his father wreaked, ha wreaked havoc on houses of worship and made mockery of believers. He was actually killed at the age of 24 himself by his own friends and followers. In fact, both of these men were just typical of their own era, the era in which they, grew, which they lived. They lived in a time where prostitutes would just openly uh, display their wares uh, in houses of worship where wizards treated disease with chance and people worshipped stars and followed their horoscopes. And in fact, the people preferred witchcraft and idolatry over education and scripture. This was a dark time in which to be born. But the person in our text was born in that time. So what do you do when you're born into a situation like that? Do you just sort of follow suit just acquiesce to what has been placed in front of you after I mean after all you're just a chip off the old rotten block right how can you run from that you know I'm sure um, when he walked by the crowds um, he heard the whispers you know he's just like his he's, he's, he's going to be just like his old man or she's going to be just like her mom was and never is it used as a compliment but they were wrong about this guy. He wasn't like them. In fact, he turned the tide, not only for himself and his family, but for a nation. He defied the odds. He stood like a mighty oak against the trends of the day, and he turned the passion of a nation back to the God of his father, David. How could a person do this? His story is, is so amazing that we're still talking about it over 2,600 years later. It's the story of a man by the name of King Josiah. Now, let me give you some background on him. He was born 600 years before Jesus Christ was born. Uh, he, he was... I mean, as you look at the kings that are recorded in Scripture, there were wiser kings, there were more powerful kings, there were wealthier kings. But as someone has written, there has never been a more courageous king than him. 
The thing that made him so courageous was the fact that he, he turned the tide. When all he had in front of him in his immediate past were bad examples. A grandfather who was a murderer and a mystic, sacrificed his children, a dad who wreaked havoc on houses of worship and pushed away anything of God. So that's what makes him, I think, pretty courageous. Because it truly takes courage to turn the tide, especially if a negative example is all you have to go on. It's easier to make excuses, isn't it? It's easier to rely on alibis than to try and find answers to the problems in which you find yourselves. And if faced, uh, you know, as he looked at his ancestry, they were uncommitted to the Lord. But yet he was able to turn the tide. Josiah did three things, and I want to give you those three things before we leave tonight. Three things that we can all do, I believe, in seeking to overcome a negative past. The first thing that he did was he accepted the challenge. He accepted the challenge. When he he came onto the scene, Josiah, the, the temple was in disarray. There was idolatry. It was rampant everywhere, even in the temple. They were bringing false gods into the temple. There were temple prostitutes. There was no law. But by the end of his 31 years, the temple was rebuilt. All of the idols were gone. They were destroyed. And the law of God was elevated back to prominence where it needed to be. The forest had been reclaimed by Josiah. The challenge Josiah accepted was huge. Like I said, Josiah's grandfather was, he was actually known as the king who filled Jerusalem with blood. Listen to the biblical record. If you, if you want to uh, turn to it, it's 2 Kings 21. 2 Kings 21, so back up there just a little bit. 2 Kings 21 verse 16 it describes him. His name was Manasseh. Moreover, Manasseh shed very much innocent blood till he had filled Jerusalem from one end to, the, to another beside the sin that he made Judah, sin, uh, Judah to sin so that they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So this was his grandfather. And further, as we said, Josiah's father, there's a record of him. His name was King Ammon. Uh, if you look at 2 King 21, look at verse 22. I mean, this was his scriptural epitaph right here. Here's his epitaph. He abandoned the Lord, the God of his fathers, and did not walk in the way of the Lord. How would you like your father's epitaph to read that? How would you like for your epitaph? I don't think any of us want an epitaph like that, that we abandoned the Lord, the God of our fathers, and we did not walk in the way of the Lord. But this was what Josiah had to go on. This was his example. So Josiah... He came to the time, his his dad has just been killed, he was the king, and so Josiah, he forms a posse. They go out, they hunt down the killers of his dad, and they take care of them, and Josiah goes over, and he goes to the the palace, and he sits on the throne, and he becomes the king. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? What's his example going to be? Can't be dad, can't be grandpa Manasseh, You know, um, you may not be working with the best of place settings. Well, don't despair, because neither was Josiah working with the best of place settings. But he accepted the challenge. And by the way, that's the first step. If anybody's going to turn around their legacy, their heritage, anything like that, if anybody's going to do that, they have to accept the challenge first. Now, I want you to look what he did next. Number two, he found a good example. Look at 2 Kings 22 and verse 2. It says, and he did what was right. This is our main text. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in all the ways of David his father and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Do you see what Josiah did? When he looked back at that, he said, "Mm, no. 
can't do that, can't do it that way. When he looked back at grandpa, nope, can't do it that way. He actually leapfrogged past his dad and past his grandpa and went all the way back to, to David, King David, and he said, that's my model. I'm going to model myself. I'm going to be like him. That's going to be my model. Now, here's an important principle that we can draw from here. The principle is this. You cannot choose your family. Amen? Can't choose your family, but you can choose your mentors. And because Josiah chose David, and David had chosen God, when that happened, <laughs> things started to happen for Josiah in his reign. I want you to look what starts happening. I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles 34. And verses 4 through 7. Because right after 1st and 2nd Kings, where we are now, and just before Ezra and Nehemiah, there's 1st and 2nd Chronicles. So if you get to Ezra, you've gone too far. Take a left and go backward. 2nd Chronicles chapter 34, verses 4 and 7. Love to hear those pages turning. Nothing like a well-oiled Bible. Look what it says. And they, okay, now hold on to that word right there. Okay, they, okay, doesn't say and Josiah. It says, and they chopped down the altars of Baals in his presence, and he cut down the incense altars that stood above them, and he broke in pieces the asherim and the carved and the metal images, and he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of those who had, or burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali and their ruins all around, he broke down the altars and beat the Asherim and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Now that term there, Ashram, that was the name of a female, of a female deity that was worshipped in Syria and Phoenicia and Canaan. You see, the reason they were still worshiping is because the, the, if you remember when we were back in the book of Exodus and working through the, through the Pentateuch, um, last year, we, we saw that Israel uh, did an incomplete job in, in, in their conquest of Canaan when they went into the promised land. They didn't clean it out completely like God had instructed them to do. And all that started to happen, all this worship, this pagan worship to Asherim actually started right about the time that Joshua died. And so they would, they would actually, what they would do is they would, they would um, uh, have these groves of, of limbless trees and they would actually worship her in those groves. And it says there that Joshua or Josiah cut that forest down. So he cut the groves down. Now, he wasn't alone. Look there again. I told you to remember that word there, they. Because that tells me that not only was the leader leading the way, there were people who were following. Because a leader who does, not work, who, who does all the work themselves is no leader at all. A leader who does all the work themselves is no leader at all. A leader has to have people following, right? And the best way you know if you're a leader, you know the best test to see if you're a leader? Turn around and see if anybody's following you. And a leader has to be careful because a leader can't get too far away. Because if a leader gets too far out in front of the people he's leading, they're kind of like, is that our leader or is that the enemy up there? So you have to stay close enough to the people to lead and be, out, be, be leading them. But as well, you have to have the people who are willing to come because a people who look only to the leadership to do the work that God has personally called them to do, well, they're neglecting the basic call of discipleship. It's a team effort. And we see that here in play. So what did they do? One, they, the incense altars were cut down. We see also the Asherah idols were broken up and they were beat into powder. 
And we see that the bones of the priests were burned. I mean, I think it's safe to say that Josiah was not exactly on a public relations tour, was he? I mean, this guy was cleaning house. He was taking care of business for the Lord. You know, no matter what prior examples uh, have been put before you uh, or given you or whatever terrible circumstances you might have been dealt when you devote your ways toward God, and that's what he did. He found that good example. He found the good example of David who had followed the Lord, and he started following the God of David. He decided to make it clear that things were going to be different. He made it clear that the things that the pagans practiced, he wasn't going to practice those things. He wasn't going to follow suit. What they, what they said, he wasn't going to say. What they did, he was not going to do. And what they taught, he was not going to teach. He rejected it and he followed the God of David. Now, I want you to look at 2 Chronicles chapter 34 again. Look at verse 8 because it was his 18th year... Uh, that the final piece of this started to come into play. It says, Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Stephan, the son of Azaliah, and Masiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. So here it is, the final piece in this puzzle, number three, he made David's God his God. You know, it's one thing to get an example, but then you have to decide yourself whether you're going to embrace it or not. You know the old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but can't make him drink? Well, that was the case here. Uh, God had led Josiah to the point of David, his father, but he had to decide whether or not he was going to embrace and follow the God of David. Well, he did. And you know, as parents, we do that with our children. We need to lead them to truth. And then pray that they will make that faith their own. You know, um, I get concerned when I hear parents say, you know, we're letting our children just, you know, figure their own truth out. Like truth is an objective thing. Truth is truth. Truth is truth whether you want to believe it or not. Whether I want to believe it or not, truth is truth. And and God's word is truth. You know, when I hear parents say that, what, what they're basically saying is, I don't know what the truth is. Because if you know what the truth is, you're going to share it with those you love most. Well, let's look at this. He, he made David's God his God because something happened when uh, the temple was being rebuilt. And the remarkable thing that happened is they found a scroll when they were rebuilding the temple. The scroll contained the words of the Pentateuch, the words of Moses, when they found it. And Josiah read it. And when he read it, he began to weep. Now, the reason he began to weep is because he read the words of the Pentateuch, the law of Moses that had been given to Moses. And as he read it, he realized how far away from God the people had gotten. And he wept. And that's a question for us tonight. Do we weep at the thought of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren growing up in a Christless culture? And Josiah did. He wept. And he sent word to a prophetess. And the prophetess, he he asked her, he said, what is going to happen to our people? What's going to become of, of Israel, the Jewish people? What's going to happen? Because he saw the writing on the wall. Here they were. They had rejected God. They had gotten away. Here's the, here's the book right in front of us. Here's the scroll of Moses. And, and God's going to judge us. And he, he realized that. And so he asks his prophetess, what's going to happen? And she receives a word from God in 2 Chronicles 34, look at verse 27. We see what she says. She says, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, 
And you have humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Listen, this is remarkable. It's remarkable because an entire generation was spared because of one person. Josiah was willing to go back and find that example and make David's God his God. And because of what he did, an entire generation of people was spared. And now maybe the example that you have had before you hasn't been the best example. But here's the thing. And maybe you look at yourself and maybe you had a great example, but maybe you've started to drift a little bit from the God of David. Well, just like Josiah, every one of us tonight listening to this have to make a choice of what we will do from this point forward. Do you rise up and make a difference? Or do you fall into a trap? The question is, do we sow seeds for future generations or do we just cut down all the trees and pillage the land? You know, a lot of people choose the the latter. One person has wrote that you can... You could go by, and as you walk by those type of people, you hear their excuses, and the excuse is this, if only is their battle cry. If only I'd been born elsewhere. If only I'd been treated fairly. If only I'd had more money. If, if, if only I'd, I'd had a more understanding spouse or a greater opportunity, if only. You know, we've all been tempted to, to say that, haven't we? Every one of us. Josiah was tempted. And to steal a a boxing analogy, a lot of people today hear the 10 count before they even step into the ring for the fight. For some people, as they look at their family album, they can't go back far enough to find a King David. And maybe that's where you are. You're looking, you're like, "I, I don't know in my family album who I could look back to who could be a great example to me. If that's the case, I would encourage you to do this. Put your family album down and pick up the Bible and read John 3, 6. Jesus said this in John 3, 6. Listen to this. The Bible, listen, the Bible is your family album now. Okay? It's your family album. From this point forward, it's not a family album. The Bible is your family album because Jesus said, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. When you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, your your fleshly relationships are secondary to your spiritual relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. When you receive Jesus as your personal Savior, you enter into a spiritual family, a spiritual relationship. You became a son or a daughter of God. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, human life comes from parents, but spiritual life comes from Jesus Christ. Your parents have given you your genes, even those faded genes that you may have. But God gives you grace through salvation in Jesus Christ. You might might look like your mama, but your heavenly father holds your eternity secure in his hands. You know, the thing is, is God is aware of who you are. Because he created you. He's aware of all of the baggage that you believe you have. And listen to me, don't miss this. He's aware of all those things and he still wants you. He still loves you. He still calls you son. He still calls you daughter. Others may have ridiculed you. Others may have made fun of you. But not your heavenly father. He loves you. He loves you. And he's going to love you through all of eternity if you place your faith and trust in his son Jesus. That's what Josiah realized. Look, in Galatians 4, 7, 
you need a family example, no problem. Because Galatians 4, 7 says, so you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. That's your family tree. That's my family tree. So, as we close this out, God has not left you and me adrift in a sea of hereditary confusion. Just like Josiah, you can choose the path you want to travel. Maybe you started down that path and with the right example and maybe you've lost your way a bit. Well, you have a choice to make beginning tonight where you're going to continue to go. Make your choice wisely. And maybe, if you choose wisely, just like Stephan who inherited that 800-year-old forest, maybe you'll begin to plant some seeds that are going to be reaped if the Lord tarries by people you've never met before. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the examples that you've placed in our way, the good and the bad. But Lord, we thank you that ultimately it comes down to the heritage that we have through Christ. That we are joint heirs with him. Oh, what a blessing that thought is. So I pray that as we leave here tonight, we would leave here with victory in our stride, knowing that we are your children, sons and daughters of a king, destined to inherit heaven and all that's there, eternal life. Oh, Father, help us to live this life with glory in mind. Not to sink our roots too deeply here, but Lord, to constantly be pointing people towards all that you have for them. Thank you for loving us. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, amen. All right, we probably ought to do a little song of something before we leave. What do you think? Somebody shout something out that everybody knows. Jesus loves me. All right, let's sing that. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Lord bless you. Have a great rest of the week.